Well, good morning, grant writers. Again, it is such a pleasure to see everyone this morning. And again, a welcome back if you've been to our first or second session. Um, again, if we've never met, my name is Casey Pedregon. I am the development coordinator at Basel Norte Community Foundation here at PDNC. Um, I focus on our umbrella. I also execute our Did I just lose everybody for a split second? <gasps> How scary. No worries. Okay, all righty. Let's see. I hope, hopefully everybody heard what I was just not speaking to myself um, in my office. But as we all know, grant writing may be a daunting and downright tedious task, but extremely instrumental in growing the development of any organization. Uh, but not to worry, we are continuing on with the basics and the do's and don'ts of grant writing with Christian Hernandez Ortega today. Christian Hernandez Ortega, an experienced grant writer and our expert speaker today, has helped local nonprofit organization and one of our cherished agency funds, Moms on Board, receive over $345,000 in funding. Christian does have a bachelor's in health promotion and a master's in public health, and outside of Moms on Board, an extensive grant writing career. Again, if you have any questions or comments throughout today's session, please write them in the chat. Please keep your sound on mute as to not disrupt the presentation. This session will be recorded, so hopefully my internet connection will continue to be stable, not unstable. Um, so in case that we you miss any tidbits of information, you can go back and review. The link to review this session will be sent to all registered email addresses along with any important follow-up documents. But Christian, go ahead and take it away. Sounds good. Don't, doesn't everybody love technology? <laughs> uh, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you. Welcome back. For those who are joining for the first time, welcome. And those who are joining for this last session, Thanks for hanging on. Uh, today's going to be another jam-packed session with information, but the aim is to give you the basic steps of how I break these areas down, and then some of the some of the seasoned professionals here, and even in our group, um, may do the same or may be doing stuff differently. But I don't necessarily think that there's a right way or wrong way to do it. It's whatever works for you and whatever processes that you put in place for your or own organization. So for one last time, we really want to hear who's in the Zoom room today. Um, and so let us know how you would describe yourself. You'll see that we provided some options, A, B, C, or D. And uh, if you have a different selection, feel free to just um, put it in there. And uh, Casey's going to be monitoring it once more as we go. And let me know, Casey. Yes. So again, we have pretty much to say a lot of actually D's there. A lot of people are students garnering more skills. It uh, looks like that's what actually is the majority this time around. All right. Okay. So that's, that's the majority this time around. And for those folks that have stayed um, along with us throughout the way and the different combination of folks, it's really nice to see everybody, um, you know, feel free to continue to use that chat box for questions or sharing ideas. Casey's going to be monitoring it as we go. So let everybody know. So we're going to be jumping into where we left off. And uh, so we started to do a, a basic deep dive into the common sections and information to prepare a grant proposal packet. And once again, I mentioned that this is something that I've learned and others may do as well, um, or may have learned along the way as well. It's just a helpful way to just start a grant proposal packet when, like I said, when you're starting out, that's a good foundational step. Uh, to help you save time, 
potentially in the long run, because you already have that information and you're able to kind of pick and pull and adapt as you go. Uh, we're going to be spending some time later on this session to see how everything that we've provided in session one, two, and three all fits together, um, just to kind of see how those particular processes look like. And today, we're also going to be going over indicators and touching back on some milestones as they relate to evaluation and slightly over sustainability. So as mentioned from the previous sessions, and the focus of these particular sessions are applying to corporate or private foundations, more of a specific to maybe a project that you all have. However, some of these principles are and steps are just as useful to integrate into your own processes and applying to other opportunities. As a recap from our last session, what did we do or what did we learn? We garnered basic knowledge about framing a statement in need. We've uh, practiced the mapping from our mapping exercise, how to define our problem or issue broadly and narrowly. Also um, then helping us identify that information that we need to look for as far as evidence or research. Uh, we also garnered the basic knowledge of writing the clear and measurable objectives and then we practice writing some SMART objectives. So one of the tips that I shared from the last session uh, that I, is that we want to logically connect all these particular areas in your proposal. And sometimes that is through that repetition of information phrased in a different way or maybe you know, just restating it. And the other part is um, painting a picture for that reviewer to know that we have thoughtfully, thoroughly planned out all these different pieces and parts and they actually fit together. So from the mapping exercise that we found, we found that our intended impact from that example of the framing project that we used is to increase physical activity among children living with disabilities. So um, if we wanna formally write this down, we might be adding more descriptives of um, that talk about our community in a very succinct way. And so that's clear for the reader who is our intended audience or our intended reach or priority population. So, that we kind of left off yesterday. So today we're going to be using a logic model, probably pretty familiar to some on the phone today or on the line today, to help us break down these areas into planning steps. I found this to be a perfect way to show you what I mean about tying things sequentially uh, and to your, how your proposal just kind of connects from the beginning to the end. And hopefully it's helpful and useful in an understandable way to introduce these particular concepts to our new grant writers in our community. Uh, so before we move on, um, if you aren't familiar with a logic model, this is one of those things that a lot of program planners and evaluators, probably no matter what field or discipline you're in may use in their practice, it just might look different um, and it just it, depending on the person and how they like to model maybe their information. I'm really just a huge believer in them um, because it makes it helps me take inventory of the information that I would need when I'm coming into a project. So um, just to kind of define a logic model, it's a roadmap that shows a simplified picture of a program or project. And it, defined, it demonstrates that those logical relationships between the sources that are invested. So here are your inputs, activities that take place, your activities that take place, and the benefits or changes that are of basically of the result. So let's kind of click this out. And then you'll see, you know, with the exercise that we did in session two, we've already have an idea of, of those objectives and activities that we are looking at. So now we're going to be need to be tying it all together or kind of see what is the change that we're going to see, you know, in the long run. So what information will we get from our well written objectives. Well, we'll know maybe a timeline of when we're going to be reaching that intended result. We'll also have an idea of what change might take place as part of the program or the
after training, uh, we'll have an idea of what we want to measure generally uh, to know if we've actually met this particular objective. And also we'll know the who, like who are we intending to, intending to reach? Who is gonna be that particular, you know, those participants receiving the training? For example, who in, it, who in our organization is responsible for the implementation or organizations responsible for the implementation? So it's just a lot of helpful information that's just gonna help us, you know, figure out, you know, why is it important to be writing well-written objectives? You know, it, it's gonna give us that information that we need for those indicators, the milestones, and help us plan for the objectives and the overall impact of the project, uh, which is really this pretty much what's coming up. Okay. So next, we're going to be working on the other side of the logic model and giving us some steps of how we can get there. So one of the areas not listed here within the logic model that we'll be talking about are outputs, but you'll see how we're going to be using them right now in terms of that, that information. So just to acknowledge to the group, um, some of these are just larger concepts that might be oversimplifying really to provide Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Is that a yes? Thumbs up? Okay, great. Uh, so we might have lost you there for a little bit. Uh, and so let me go ahead and go back to sharing my screen. So we were here on the this side of the particular logic model and we're jumping back in. <laughs> uh, we talked about um, some of the things that we're gonna be talking about in terms of the outputs. We're also um, wanting to acknowledge to the group that these are larger concepts that might um, might be, oh, I'm, I might be oversimplifying, but it's really just to provide grass, you know, you grassroots organizations with that basic information of what you need to get started. And it, you know, and not to think that it's something you can't do because you can do it. Okay, so you can do it. I'm your biggest cheerleader. <laughs> and so for outputs, uh, and then um, Casey, let me know if there's anything in the chat that I need to be um, needing to go over again. Uh, for the outputs, we just need to think about what's going to happen after we implement these particular activities or objectives. Is there a specific change that's going to occur after, you know, you implement them? Below is just a helpful example of, you know, how caring from our, oh, yeah, okay. Is a helpful example caring, you know, that particular frame topic or that particular project that we were talking about from the last session? Um, one of the activities uh, to help us get to the overall impact uh, could be planning. Could be plan. Uh, could be planning. Um, so one of the activities to help us get to the overall impact is planning a community outreach and promotional plan. And uh, there could be two outputs from this particular activity. And you can see that the, this is activity. And then here is the out, those particular outputs that we can get potentially from that activity, which is increasing community awareness of the all of those. Abilities or practitioners that work. To to the playground, to use the playground, okay? This is a fun one, huh, today? So next, we're gonna be planning our indicators and metrics. So from the last slide, we defined our outputs, um, you know, and now we're gonna be talking about how are we gonna measure the change So, for instance, you'll see here that if under our promotional plan we had that we're going to be implementing a social media strategy, then in terms of performance measures, we could potentially look at, you know, performance of the social media campaign 
through the number of impressions, um, the number of engagements, and we can also think about the reach. And then here in terms of community utilization of the abilities playground there might be metrics that the county, for example, already collects. And so that could be an indirect measure to help us demonstrate, you know, we've met this particular, this objective. And the other thing we can do is also, you know, directly observe and have a tally of the number of individuals or families util utilizing the playground. So that's that, you know, directly observing and we're gonna know that particular utilization. So it just depends on your staff capacity, of course, uh, and, and, and um, whether or not, you know, finding something that's real, realistic for your organization to, to do in terms of measurement. So now it's time for us to think about, so, you know, the change that would occur. For example, we'd like to increase the community awareness of, of, the, play, of the playground. This might be through, you know, the build phase. So we, uh, so the community knows that there is a playground being built for inclusive play. And um, using that timeline, we might be able to determine that when we launch that social media strategy and when we're gonna get those particular performance measures by, um, we can estimate maybe about a year. So um, given this particular output, maybe we wanna label that as a short outcome because that's gonna happen maybe within the year. And then for community utilization, we would need to think about how long is the, is the how long is it going to take to build the playground and the overall timeline of the project? Not thinking that there's going to be a worldwide pandemic that changes the course of everything and of our history, but that's also something that we would have to take into account into our timeline. And, and that might be something that is um, one of the barriers or challenges that we described that could impact our timeline, right? So let's say for learning purposes, by the time we see a change Maybe it'll be about three years. So, you know, let's label this as an intermediate outcome. So happening within the three to five years. Um, determining what matrix suits us and labeling and re refining those outcomes, you know, we can start to re revisit the impact. Technically, we'll know that our activities and objectives will get us to this outcome. And through our framing exercise that we did in session two, we know that our solution or approach is in alignment with evidence-based practice or practice in our discipline and uh, or fields shown research to support that we will reach this intended impact because we're implementing this particular approach and, and we know that, that that's gonna happen. And so, that might be the formal way to put it, but I know in our last convening, there was also mention of some examples. So here are two. One is framing um, from the framing that, or the project that we've been using to frame. Um, and then the other is not related to a build, but something else. You'll see that um, how the uh, information is presented, kind of numbering them off. Because of the online application, we won't have the font the bold, the underlines, uh, to make the certain area in the narrative pop out. So it's time to get creative, um, <laughs> right? Uh, so these are examples of written statements. Uh, I provided the two because they're both different types of projects and one's word worded differently than the other that you can see. And the second one really reinforces, as we've been kind of talking throughout the session one, two, and three, how it's tightly aligned with the foundation stated priorities. Right, what we can see here and how it is kind of tightly aligned with that particular uh, stated priority. Okay. And to wrap up this session, our section, uh, now we have <laughs> now we have walked through the majority of the areas of this model. And one thing to share as well, a logic model might be an item to take to take with you to a funder meeting or to attach as an appendices, um, as it's a good snapshot of your project and it really helps communicate, you know, that whole sequential, like how everything ties together in your narrative. Um, heading into our milestones. So I've seen written, I've seen it written as 
benchmark. I've seen it written as milestones. Uh, from what I've seen online and on the online applications lately, it's been worded as milestones, and that's pretty common. Uh, an application will ask you, what is the timeline? What are the expected milestones? And I provided with you, once again, two, two of those examples of how it looks like. For example, two, I fit it into something in the, as an outline. For this particular proposal, it was pretty traditional, so we were able to provide a timeline of those benchmarks. And here is, um, you know, here I've provided it in numbers, so the expected timeline, you know, so most of the time for milestones, I'll number them, like ex the expected milestones of this project, well, one, two, three, four, five. Um, there's, I think, just remember, I guess, the limit and not necessarily to put too many, but also there might be words like specific limits on how long, basically in, in terms of the words. So you might be only able to fit five or might be able to only fit a certain number. So you can keep that in mind as you write them. So you'll see here that the expected milestones, for example, to develop and provide educational sessions for this leadership around smoke-free housing, where we want to perform a uh, bilingual community forum and surveys to determine a support for a policy. We want to ensure that we develop a resource and that we get input from the residents about the resource. So you can see how these things are kind of numbered in terms of benchmarks. Okay. Touching on sustainability. So not speaking for foundations at all, um, but uh, I'm sure that they all want to make a difference. And foundations want to know, you know, if the funds are going to have a significant impact on whether, um, you know, you'll con continue to sustain the efforts of the project, you know, after the funding expires. And so each program and project is different. And what, you know, what would be considered feasible as a strategy to continue um, the project or program will vary. So it's really what you find is feasible in terms of what your uh, capacity is. So overall, you know, just be thoughtful, realistic about this section and the likelihood of sustaining or continuing that program or project. Um, the section in itself is pretty brief. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are some sample questions to kind of help you get started in terms of forming um, the information. Uh, you know, how will your investment live on, you know, within your organization? How do you intend to sustain um, the program or project beyond, you know, that, that grant funding after the grant funding expires? How will you leverage or diversify um, your funding efforts prior to expiring? Populations. So if there's a particular service that you're performing, is there a plan, for example, to kind of work with the local government to subsidize or leverage costs from another organization? So um, that's kind of just briefly touching on sustainability, but um, really just depends on, on how, you, how you kind of see it. So when thinking about the grant needs that might be a good fit to apply for, think about the staff capacity, you know, your staff capacity, to implement and carry out um, activities, including the reporting of grants that you'd like to apply to. Um, if you're piecing together your funding to raise, um, you know, to raise funds with grants and other funds, it might be easier to set the same metrics and indicators depending on your project and that's if that's possible. Um, you know, less is more. If, for example, they say, yes, we fund playgrounds, but you'll have to do a curriculum that goes along with the playground. If you're not planning on doing a curriculum or have any paid additional staff to support X, Y, Z, um, that grant opportunity might not be a good fit to apply for, but there might be others where it really fits the needs of what you're trying to achieve. If you know that the opportunity requires a lot of reporting or tracking, do you have that capacity um, you know, to do more than just writing an end of the year report? If you have multiple grants for with multiple reporting structures or metrics, that might be hard to keep up, just depending on your organizational type. Um, the list might be able to kind of go on and on and on, and those of you here today might also kind of know some things as well. Um, but does your organization, at the end of the day, does your organization have a staff capacity to do what you need to do to wrap it up and set you out to be 
successful? And should another opportunity for refunding potentially the project get opened up, right? So now we're gonna to get to bring it all in from sessions one, two, and three, and how does everything that you've learned practically fit together? So I'm gonna share my screen to do this right here, and hopefully everybody is going to be able to see it. So you'll see that I've just kind of done a shell of, of a folder for for the educational purposes only, but you'll see how we have, we from session one, we had a grant lead tracker example, and then we also have a folder for our grant packet, and we also have a folder for our submissions. And for the grant lead tracker, you'll see that this, this might be very familiar to you all um, in terms of in session one, how we kind of identified grant leads and then narrowed down the grant leads and how we want to color code this uh, to make sure that we know and everybody on our team knows um, what we're working on. You'll see in terms of the grant packet, you'll see how each section, this is really how I do it. So I kind of divide all these particular sections out to their own page. And up in above, right? And then, <laughs> And then for the project plan, I just wanted to kind of click to the project plan. You'll see what the, um, some of those the stuff from the presentations, a lot of the, um, I guess, uh, a lot of the, what was provided on the slides, I, I provided here in terms of copying and pasting. You'll see key partnerships. You'll want to put your aims. You want to put your objectives, evaluation indicators, and sustainability. Next, we're going to be going to our submissions. And then as we're working on submissions, um, sorry, right here, you'll see that there's, we're working on two um, grant proposals. And when I click into submissions, you'll see this maybe recognizable thing where you'll be able to see what you did to kind of narrow down and pick that you're gonna be applying to this particular opportunity. And, and then you're gonna have your online application and um, you're gonna be copying and pasting those questions from the online application to an actual document, either in Word or Google or shared space for, for your team. And then um, when you're done, you, you basically go and copy it into the online application. So that's, I just wanted to kind of give you a little snapshot of how that looks like and how, it can, how all this information can be useful for you and how to kind of operationalize all the stuff that I've kind of shared with you. And so, yeah. So I'm gonna go back to our presentation. And then, um, you know, just as a reminder, you know, these steps are just to be, steps are for just building that grant proposal packet. The process will just help you pull plug and adapt the language that you create um, when responding to opportunities, always follow the guidelines and the section headers provided by the funding opportunity that you seek. Always for sure, um, be, if, if you're applying to multiple grants, you want to make sure that you are integrating the language from that foundation into, into your language to make sure that, you know, it also, you know, kind of, they also know what particular, particular priority area that you're applying to. So just to kind of um, share that as a reminder and remember, you can do it. So in case you forgot. So with everything, oh, Casey, oh, sorry. Yes, I can unmute you. Sorry, everybody. Okay, great. Great. So, um, how do you feel going back to your orgs and teams explaining the basics? You know, this is another question that we've used, and so we want to check in with everybody. Um, you know, you see the options A, B, C, or D. You know, are you able to kind of share some of the basic information? Are you able to implement anything? Are you able to just, uh, you know, do you look forward to adding these tools in your toolbox? So let us know. And Casey, are you able to? Yes. I'm sorry when I got kicked out. I <laughs> lost all co-host rights. But yes, yeah, so it looks like we mm -hmm. 
might have. Uh, you're freezing, but it looks like we got some A, B, C's, or D's, and it looks like we got some C's. Um, <laughs> so things. Um, and so, yes, it looks like we got a variety, and I'm glad that some of this information is helpful and useful in a way that you can provide it. So now we're going to be kind of jumping into our Q&A. Oh, one thing before I stop sharing, um, but just to let everybody know, on um, when you receive the slides, you'll be able to kind of see that um, within the references that I've linked this, this book. Um, this is the book that I used very, and it's kind of paid itself off by now. <laughs> so so uh, I've used it a lot for the nonprofit grant writing stuff that I've done. And it's been useful because it provides, you know, also, you know, budget narrative examples, as well as ways that you can kind of do Excel formulas. So it's just really, really helpful. Or I found, I found it helpful. So I just kind of wanted to share that with you. And we can kind of jump into our Q&A um, now. Awesome. Yep. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, go ahead and give you all a couple seconds. I'm so sorry again for all of the technical difficulties today. Um, we will record re-record any pieces that were um, missing. Um, so just in case you can review the session um, at a later time. But let's see, looks like we don't have any questions yet. Um, I'll go ahead and give it a couple more seconds. Um, but either way, thank you, Christian, so much for, you know, sharing your knowledge with us on grant writing. We really appreciate it. Oh, Candice asked a fabulous question. She asked, can I take you home and keep you for all my grant writing needs? You're magic. Awesome. <laughs> yes. And we're gonna and I see that you're green hope, so I, hopefully that it that's around planting. Um so, yeah. I love well, gardening. And so <laughs> let me I was gonna scroll up to see if there's any other questions that we might have missed that were uh, nope. Okay. Great. Awesome. So if you and your organization is looking for more capacity building workshops, again, you came to the right place. Visit our website at pdnfoundation.org to purchase on-demand access to our nonprofit conference recordings. Um, I'm going to stop because it looks like we a question did come in. Um, it's asking, um, Lorana is asking, is it okay to reuse portions of a grant for other submissions? I know in academia that can be thought of as self-plagiarism. I assume that's not the, sa the same in grant writing for these types of grants. Christian, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I think for, for yeah, for writing for these particular grants, it, it is kind of the way that you're adapting it. So it's not necessarily you're going to turn around and go submit. So the, the, the thought behind building a grant packet isn't to go around to like have a grant packet and submit it to like 10 different, 10, 10 different foundations. So the their priority areas, make sure that you're aligning the information with the priority areas, make sure that so so there are a lot of checks that you want to do before. Um, you don't want necessarily to kind of use the same grant packet um, or this after you build it and send it out or use the same. It, it really is about adapting and ensuring that the information you need is within, within what you're trying to work on. Um, so does that make sense? So. To make sure that it's alignment, it, there is alignment with the actual foundation that you're applying to. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christian. Um, so Candice is asking another question. Um, and again, I think this is um, something that we all kind of we, we discuss in our first session. Um, are there any grant platform grants platforms you suggest we look for grants on? I know some require subscriptions, which I'm willing to pay just want to find a good one. Yes, and so I was able to kind of do some digging as well. Our, our, um, but well, for Southern New Mexico, in terms of Las Vegas, there it is provided um, in terms under I think one of their chamber of commerce. But things that are not available to us here in in Boston, in terms of um, libraries, is the Foundation Center. There's a thing called the Foundation Center, and they have a subscription 
that's available. There are a lot of libraries, um, you know, municipal libraries across the country that have this subscription for community members to use or residents to use. That's something that we don't have, but that uh, is gonna give you the information that you need, I guess, to identify these um, particular, um, when a RFP's out or also more information about, um, about the actual foundation, about, you know, you know, all those nice graphs and information about where they funded, what, what did they traditionally funded and other stuff. I know um, there's another subscription to uh, GuideStar. Um, I'm not necessarily too familiar, but I do know that the uh, Boston with the Community Foundation uses that one and has, and so um, the other one that I've, that I've subscribed to that's not necessarily as expensive as those <laughs> are, um, is, is uh, GrantWatch, but I, it's not necessarily as user friendly to me, so I wouldn't necessarily, but I think it, it might be user friendly to you, but it is on the cheaper end of an annual subscription, but I think um, the one that's going to cost a lot, and it just depends on whether or not, you know, you have a budget for it, might be Foundation Center. Um, Great, thank you, Christian. Mm -hmm. so, so Santiago is asking, this will be the, our last question. Some grants would like for you to collaborate with other agencies. What are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so if there's an opportunity in, in, in the terms of the field or the discipline that you're in, or it, it actually it might be non-traditional partners that you would think that are kind of non-traditional to your discipline. Um, I think collaboration is super super duper key, uh, especially uh, for us to maximize the resources that we bring into the community as organizations. Um, I think it just finds ways that we can leverage each other um, in that particular aspect. So I would say um, if there's an opportunity to collaborate with agencies and maybe there's a way where, um, I think a lot of it is just like old fashioned networking. Uh, I will old fashioned like it's in person networking, but also coming to these particular forums and see if there's any um, particular people that kind of jump out and see if there's ways that you can exchange information. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christian, and thank you all for your amazing questions. Again, if you're looking for more training, participating in El Paso Giving Day is the perfect opportunity for your organization to receive social media, donor retention, communications, and board member training. Our first workshop on donor retention does begin on July 22nd. Um, so if you have any questions about El Paso Giving Day and the benefits from participating, please feel free to call or, um, call or email me or visit El Paso givingdate.org. Again, all registered email addresses will be receiving the recording to, to today's session, along with the material Christian has discussed today. Please give us a um, couple days on today since we will need to review and re-record some pieces. Um, I will uh, I will not see you all next week. Thank you all so much for, you know, being with us for these past three weeks. It was a pleasure um, seeing your all's faces and learning more about grant writing. So thank you so much, Christian, for sharing your knowledge with us. And may you all have a fabulous rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christian. There we go.